And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church in the 70s and 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, the women's circles, which are these participatory, uh, you know, women's discussion groups were sponsored by the church, uh, you know, as well. Um, and so a lot of the, you know, again, this left wing Catholic Catholicism has, has fed into um, a broader, you know, a broader social transformation that's now manifested. Welcome to The Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Dean. I'm a Catholic PhD student in philosophy at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto, uh, where I work on Christianity and leftism, media, theory, and uh, I write as a journalist. I'm Matt. I teach media studies at Greenville University in Greenville, Illinois. My research interests are media archaeology, cultural theory, and uh, yeah, Christianity and leftist politics. That's that's my new one. Well, that's my reoccurring one. <laughs> still doing that eh still doing it uh man uh this is uh we got some big plans in terms of christianity and leftist politics uh for the future so make sure you stay tuned to future episodes <laughs> cool cool That's stuff true. on the horizon <laughs> so uh, this is the enigmatic uh eschatological you know now you're only listening through a prism darkly but soon soon, soon. it'll be revealed in full <laughs> Uh, today we're talking with George Chigarella Mar, which is pretty exciting. He's the Associate Professor of Politics and Global Studies at Drexel University in Philadelphia. That, that's a complicated situation, I guess. Um, you can read a bunch of things about that. Uh, <laughs> he is the author of three books, We Created Chavez, Decolonizing Dialectics, and Building the Commune, and a bunch of articles, and they are all very good. Uh, in the episode, we talk about Venezuela, Christianity and Chavismo, and Building Dual Power. Uh, if you like what you hear, we also have a newsletter called The Magnifesto, and this week we're including a bunch of resources on Venezuela and Christianity, so check that out at tinyletter.com slash the Magnificast. Also, if you could hop on over to iTunes and give us a review, that would be super helpful. All right, so let's uh, get into it. Um, so we don't want to make the whole episode about academic freedom, uh, or whatever, but we did want to acknowledge that your institution put you on leave and that's, uh, not great or suspended you. I don't know what the proper term is, but anyway, uh, in light of that, we were wondering if you had any thoughts about like academic freedom, especially being like a leftist intellectual in the United States right now. I mean, I think just to say things that are probably obvious, which is that, I mean, I think being uh, in the academy on the left right now is is both sort of difficult, but also has a lot of uh, potential, particularly in and around the election of Trump, after which the terrain, I think, shifted very dramatically. A lot of us found ourselves suddenly very much under attack um, from the right wing uh, with these coordinated outrage campaigns in right wing media. Um, and we have the right and the far right and the alt right in particular targeting campuses and really trying to sort of drive this wedge into the campus that will push out the leftists and push out the radicals and push out the anti-racists. And so I think, uh, you know, this is, of course, a very dangerous time on campus, um, but it's a time that we need to fight for. And precisely the same dynamics, I think, that make it dangerous, uh, you know, give it so much potential. We have students being mobilized in increasing numbers, uh, being interested in radical politics. And this is precisely why um, you know, I think the revolution uh, won't come from the campuses, um, but, mm-hmm. the, you know, often the constituency that we need to mobilize, there's a huge element on campus of, of students who are ready really to throw down for radical politics. And we need to take advantage of that in any way possible. Uh, yeah, that's very helpful to hear, I think. Uh, Adam Kotzko has a really cool uh, comment on this whole sort of situation as well, that it's not like these like right wing folks even care about universities in the first place. They're just, you know, pushing their agenda um <laughs> no they want to just dis- they want to destroy universities and i think this is what university right. administrations need to realize is that these are not people who care about academic freedom uh, or free speech on campus for example as they say uh, they actually want to destroy the institution yeah yeah um well uh <laughs> instead of getting kind of pulled down in the minutia of that situation even though it is interesting and worth thinking about um could you just tell us about uh, your overall research interests and uh, what motivates you uh in the work that you do 
Yeah, what do you like to research for actual fun instead of uh, defending yourself <laughs> in front of an institution? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I'm a political theorist. That means I'm trained to sort of work with political concepts and thoughts and ideas in relation to power and in relation to, uh, you know, to the world. Um, and that for me has often taken the form of radical um, political theory and what you can understand to be decolonial or anti colonial uh, political theory. Um, this is often for me grounded in the struggles of sort of the African diaspora, whether it's black struggles in the US and black social movements um, or Latin American, you know, politics, social movements, revolutionary movements. Um, and for me, it's a really a question of like using, uh, you know, the kind of theoretical tools that we have at our disposal to rethink and to think through power in a different way, to think about power, for example, from the bottom up, the way in which political movements, revolutionary movements exert power um, on political leaders and transform politics. And the reality that, you know, whether it's in the U.S. or Latin America, it's really social movements and, and people in the streets organizing that set history into motion, whether it's Black Lives Matter in the U.S. or things that have been going on for many years in Latin America, um, the question is really locating that power, understanding how it works and how it functions and what we can do kind of to deepen it. Yeah, that's what I think I found most interesting about some of your work. Uh, you wrote a bunch of books. For people that don't know, um, your most recent book is Decolonizing Dialectics. Uh, but I first kind of came into your work reading Building the Commune, and uh, I really appreciate the way that you draw out these bottom-up movements, as you were just saying, in the context of, like, actual countries in Latin America. So it's not just theoretical. It's like there are historical material dimensions to this kind of thing. Um, can you just summarize your interest in Latin American politics in particular and why you think that's important, especially for English-speaking scholars or, or activists or whoever? I was drawn to Latin America, you know, because of revolutionary movements there, because of the Zapatistas in particular, and then later to the question of what's going on in Venezuela and other places, uh, most recently back to Mexico doing research on kind of armed self-defense movements that I find to be, you know, incredibly interesting. But I think we need to understand Latin America is not separate uh, from the United States or from the global history that we're living uh, in the present, our global moment. Um, when we look at, you know, if we understand our moment, this moment of polarization of uh, radical upsurge um, and right wing mobilization, um, this is a moment marked by the failure and the crisis of the neoliberal order, whether it be the EU um, in Europe or NAFTA, um, and that has sort of abandoned great numbers of people, poor people of all colors, um, and has created the, the sort of uh, breeding ground for left-wing revolutionary movements and for, you know, right-wing fascist, quasi-fascist movements at the same time. Um, and in that global history, in understanding our contemporary movement as a, as a you know, our contemporary moment as a, a moment in motion and in sort of dynamic, you know, uh, transformation, Latin America is a central part because it was in Latin America, really, that neoliberalism was tested out. That was the sort of laboratory, beginning particularly with the coup in Chile um, against Salvador Allende and the institution of a really, uh, the attempt to institute really radical structural adjustment and neoliberal reforms. Um, this, you know, this was decades ago, uh, and the resistance to that neoliberalism um, began, you know, decades ago as well. Um, so some of the dynamics that we're actually living today um, were lived decades ago in this, you know, at the, at the outset of this sort of process of resistance that emerged, this reverse swing against neoliberalism. That importance in, in South America is uh, really interesting. Uh, one one specific geography you pick up is Venezuela. Could you, um, I mean, in two of your books, it's like one of the main um one of the main settings. Could you tell us about uh, what you find uh, particularly interesting about Venezuela? I mean, obviously, there's a, a strong push against neoliberalism there. Um, but uh, what particularly um, motivated you to think about Venezuela and write about Venezuela? Yeah, I argue that, I mean, and th this sort of global fight back against neoliberalism, I think, begins there, honestly. I think it's underrecognized that in 1989, there was a mass rebellion against uh, neoliberal structural adjustment called the Caracaso, and it was a week-long riot and rebellion, and it's the source and the origin of everything that has come since in Venezuela. It was a moment in which history was kind of broken open and allowed for radical movements to surge forth and to begin to build something and push for something uh, different. Um, and this was followed in, you know, by similar rebellions, of course, the Zapatistas in 94, as well as indigenous led rebellions in Bolivia, in Ecuador. Um, and in those places, like in Venezuela, they, they sort of, you know, the movements were able to, to, to take down governments and to throw others into power, to throw Chavez, Morales, you know, Rafael Correa into power, um, and to begin to, you know, work through some of the questions of what it would look like to build an alternative uh, order 
um, against you know the prevalent neoliberalism of the time. In Venezuela, of course, this took the form of Chavismo, a mass revolutionary movement um, that really became the dominant force and in some ways remains dominant uh, in, in, in a lot of ways in Venezuela and was able to dramatically transform the political terrain of the country um, under the, you know, the leadership, I could say, of, of Chavez. Um, but understanding leadership um, to be, you know, a little different from maybe we tend to, how we tend to think about it. Because Chavez himself, as I've argued consistently, was himself a product of these revolutionary movements. Um, they created him. They took someone who was a moderate social democrat uh, when he was running for election in 1998, and they transformed him into a, you know, socialist, into someone who was quoting Luxembourg and Gramsci on, on TV, and then playing his role in transforming and educating and deepening uh, mass popular consciousness when it came to um, what a different society would look like, what was called 21st century socialism. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to imagine. Uh, I mean, I'm an American, but I live in Canada right now, and I can't imagine a political leader quoting Luxembourg or Gramsci at all. <laughs> um, so that's pretty amazing. Could you uh, explain just a little bit of some of the like basic driving ideas and practices um, just behind Chavismo generally, uh, especially for people whose only exposure to um, Venezuelan governance is maybe like media narratives that suggest Maduro is like a, you know, rabid dictator or something like that, just like Chavez or something, uh, something absurd. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there are a few, uh, I think, you know, threads uh, that run through Chavismo. One is participation. This is the one that's probably the least recognized. The idea this is a participatory movement um, that sought to develop what's called pro protagonistic power of the grassroots people. And so from the beginning, as I said, this began with a mass rebellion in the streets. It continued, though, with this dynamic between what you would call the constituent power of the grassroots and the constituted power of the institutional state um, and, and a dynamic relation in which people participated en masse in the rewriting of the Constitution, the approval of that Constitution, and in the building of participatory alternatives in what were called communal councils and later uh, communes, uh, the, you know, these sort of grassroots institutions of political participation, but also of economic production. Um, and so this participatory aspect is crucial. And of course, you know, uh, um, it's fused with an understanding of social equality, fused with an understanding of overcoming the dramatic inequalities that govern not only Venezuela, but Latin America uh, as a whole. Um, and also with this idea of what's called endogenous development, that what you, when you look at dependent countries uh, in the sort of sort of poor countries in the global structure, um, they are often reliant on the global economy and they're forced into producing certain commodities for the global market, in Venezuela's case, oil. Um, and they are discouraged from producing the things that they actually need. Um, and this is something that Chavismo has always sought to, you know, with only partial success, sought to transform. In other words, to produce what people need you know, domestically, um, to be able to think about uh, developing a country from the inside out, as opposed to being so focused on the global market. Um, and this is where these communal structures are so key, because they hold at least the potential to produce locally what people need and to not have to rely on the market, to not have to rely on uh, imported goods, because Venezuela still imports almost all of the food that it's con that is consumed. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, it's really a dramatic global, you know, dependence on the global economy. And so these are some of the sort of guiding lights uh, of Chavismo. I mean, and, and to these, we could add sort of a, a really innovative understanding of gender equality. Um, and, you know, and, you know, the first place that wages for housework is ever instituted, uh, you know, on any kind of level. Um, and, you know, in a particular understanding of anti-colonial and anti-racist praxis when it comes to indigenous and Afro Venezuelans. These are all parts of this broad Chavista identity, which is a shifting and transforming thing historically, uh, which is never, you know, perfectly, you know, honed when it comes to different elements, but, um, but which, you know, move forward as this sort of really dynamic process. Uh, could you say a little bit about uh, what's happened to sort of the, the Chavismo identity and that whole bit you just kind of talked about under Maduro? Has that changed any or does it still like sort of persist? It certainly persists. Things have become much, much more complicated. And I definitely don't want to understate that. Um, Maduro is not Chavez, but this is, I think, really not the decisive, uh, you know, point, um, because what happened was that Maduro's, uh, you know, came to power, was elected when Chavez had died, which was crucially, you know, uh, a crucial symbolic blow to the revolution. Um, the uh, oil prices collapsed and a currency crisis began to develop in the country, um, at which point the Venezuelan opposition went on a sort of ferocious offensive that has continued and continues to this very day. Um, 
and is you know attempting to unseat Maduro by any by any means necessary. So Maduro is governing in a very different situation, a dramatic economic and social crisis in which uh, you know imported goods have declined because of the collapse in, in the oil you know prices as well as uh, you know the you know missteps in the in the currency system that have made it very difficult for people to even eat the way they were eating a couple of years ago. Um, and so this is an incredibly difficult situation. But throughout this, the revolutionary grassroots as the driving force of Chavismo um, remain vibrant, you know, remain involved. Um, and they actually, the reality is that they're the ones who are proposing real alternatives to this crisis um, that often even governing elites, even Chavista elites uh, don't recognize or don't pay enough attention to. Um, and in building the commune, I lay out a real clash and contradiction between, uh, you know, between Chavista leaders, you know, elected leaders of Chavismo and the grassroots. And this is not an easy relationship. And often it's been a directly, you know, conflictive relationship in which the revolutionaries on the grassroots level see the revolutionaries in the state um, as often their enemies. Yeah, I feel like most people kind of um, have a hard time uh, getting their head around, especially Maduro's situation. Um, I was just thinking, too, about uh, all the sanctions that are being placed on Venezuela globally, which obviously, as you're talking about it here, makes a huge difference when your country is so integrated into global markets. And I uh, it's tough, like here in, in Toronto, very soon, Christia Freeland, who's the uh, uh, UN ambassador um, for Canada and Venezuela, she's going to come and talk about Venezuela and how she's, you know, happily kind of following the Trump party line on all that. Um, do you know any uh, kind of really helpful ways that English speaking people can get like a better perspective on what's going on there? Are there particular media outlets, journalists, etc., cetera, um, that just help round it out uh, that you would recommend or something like that? I think it's difficult. You know, the really one of the only good outlets is Venezuela Analysis, um, which has good, critical English language media coverage that that I think pretty systematically tries to push back against the predominant narratives. Um, and that serves as kind of a, you know, a clearinghouse for, you know, for media coming from other sources. So that's the best place to check. Uh, uh, that's great. Yeah. On that, that same point, um, the the U.S., like there's a an overwhelmingly negative media narrative in the U.S. about uh, Venezuela and protests against Maduro and everything else. Um, and th that is disheartening and, uh, not great. Um, so, uh, do you have a particularly strong opinion on these narratives? I, I would imagine that you do. Um, like do, how do they get started? Like what purpose do they serve? Like, um, do they serve just imperialist countries like the U S or is there something deeper going on here? I mean, the, the narrative is put forward by the Venezuelan opposition and picked mm. up by international media and foreign governments. So it's, I mean, it's a pretty tight circuit. Um, and this circuit is a very, uh, you know, Unsurprising one, given the fact that, you know, Venezuelan elites spend half of their time in Miami anyway um, and consider themselves <laughs> to be at least partially, uh, you know, U.S. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. citizens. Um, and, and so what but what what the, the Venezuelan opposition, which is really just sort of a rabid uh, reactionary, you know, uh, you know, really brutally, brutally conservative um, opposition. Um, what they're trying to do is to paint themselves as the sort of democratic opposition to an anti-democratic regime, despite the fact that they've never cared about democracy. They've never cared about the poor. Um, and the reason that they can't often can't get elected is because people know that and people sense that. And so um, you had just these recent state governor elections in which the opposition couldn't even get their get their shit together um, sufficiently to take advantage of what is really, you know, a disaffected Chavismo and, and, and to win these local and regional elections. Um, and, you know, so the opposition is not popular. Even no matter how much popularity the, the, the Maduro government loses, the opposition doesn't seem to be gaining uh, any popularity. And so they resort often, you know, in, in the absence of, of, of being able to win elections, often they resort to street protest and attempt to topple the government. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that we saw particularly in 2014, but then more recently, uh, you know, last year. And, and it's, you know, really been a, a kind of brutal uh, war of attrition in which the opposition is constantly in the streets, burning barricades, killing people a lot of times, and then, of course, themselves being killed in clashes with security forces sometimes, um, and trying to create a, situ a situation of what they call ungovernability um, as a way to, uh, you know, as a way to encourage some kind of intervention, whether it's by the U.S. or by the Venezuelan military. Um, and this foreign narrative, which uses the press and pushes the idea of discrediting uh, a democratically elected government, uh, you know, this is really a huge part of that process. Um, yeah, on a, a similar point, I guess that that uh, negative media narrative in the, in the United States has taken hold in a lot of like, uh, 
I guess, su- surprising places and surprising ways. Like the the left in the United States has been particularly unkind and uh, I don't know, ideologically opposed to what's going uh, to like the to Maduro and uh, su- like supporting Venezuela in general. Um, like U.S. U.S. leftists are. Um, often hesitant to like show solidarity in any way with Venezuela. Um, could you comment on that? Like, w- why do you think that is? Why are, uh, why aren't people like r- rushing, rushing with solidarity in, in this, uh, in this situation? I, I mean, there are a lot of causes for it. I think there are internal causes to the left that make it easier for us to show solidarity when everything is great and mm-hmm. harder to show solidarity mm-hmm. when things are difficult. And I think this has to do with certain understandings, understandings of revolutionary change. Uh, the idea that revolutions are maybe easy or the idea that they don't entail a complicated and painful and fraught transitional stage, which, which is, you know, inevitable. You know, when we're trying to make a revolution, we have brutal, bloodthirsty enemies that we're fighting against Um, and fighting against them will not be easy or clean or, you know, uh, you know, a simplistic, uh, you know, situation. And, you know, and it's going to be complicated. And I think there is a sector of the left that does not want to understand that complexity of revolutionary transition. Um, But then there's another sector in this slightly different sector that is sort of, uh, you know, very critical of anything that doesn't look like the model of revolution uh, mm-hmm. that, you know, that they think, you know, sort of pristine understanding that they think it should follow, whether, you know, it's the anarchist aversion to Chavez because he occasionally wore a military uniform or because he was a so-called populist or because, you know, of no sé qué. But, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, this question of it not looking like, uh, you know, the revolution that we prescribe from our, you know, info ah. shops in the United States. Um, and, you know, and I think that also creates this inability to grasp the essence of what's going on, which is this question of a revolution being a mass phenomenon. And the question is always, where are the masses and why are they there? Um, and, you know, and that's what's essential to grasp when it comes to these things as leftists, as revolutionaries, and to do so critically to understand the ways in which if the masses are being, uh, of course, misled in a certain way, um, that that's, you know, that that's something we need to be very attentive to. But to think that the masses are stupid and wrong is not a revolutionary position. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so this is a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics, in case you haven't heard. Um, <laughs> and, I, guess should, uh, I guess we should get to that. <laughs> well, uh, it's interesting. One reason Venezuela is especially interesting is that Hugo Chavez was a Christian and he used Christianity in his speeches um, alongside people like Luxembourg and Gramsci. Uh, do you think that that played an important part in his political imaginary at all? Uh, I mean, having written on it and spent time thinking really hard about Venezuela, uh, where have you seen Christianity kind of show up, uh, at least in Chavismo? Yeah, no, it, it was, it's been crucial, although Chavez was very cagey about what sort of Christianity he, he believed in. He was never really open about that. Um, he would refer to symbolism, and so there was a lot of speculation about what precisely he believed, uh, or if he believed uh, at all. Um, but what's clear is that, uh, you know, he certainly appealed to um, the legacy of radical Christianity uh, in Venezuela. Um, now, Christianity in Venezuela is, is complicated in a lot of ways. It's got, you know, got the sort of conservative church apparatus at the same time that you have the legacies of Vatican II and like liberation theology. Um, and at the same time, people are very are all Catholic, but but in a, or, you know, a lot of people are Catholic, but also in a very kind of like laid back way that doesn't necessarily you know have a huge implications for their everyday lives and then uh, finally i guess you have this growing evangelical movement which um openly clashed with the venezuelan government for its kind of op- for its kind of colonial interventions you know its attempts to go in and, and recruit and you know uh, make inroads in indigenous communities in southern venezuela in particular and to do so with a really reactionary imperialist politics as well so you've had this sort of you know complicated mix but um, what's important is that christian uh, revolutionary christian identity was a clear part of chavismo the revolutionary left in venezuela had begun to integrate you know um, religious symbolism uh, decades ago um, and there's a bigger point as well which is that chavista identity um, you know uh, symbolically parallels uh, some aspects of religious identity now this is not the caricature of the media that says oh people are saying chavez was my god whatever like um you know identifying with chavez as though he were a religious figure um these visions actually completely misunderstand the fact that this religious identification is actually a subset of a broader political identification in which people identify with a revolutionary project um, and understand that 
the way, you know, what we call empty signifiers in politics, the way that people are able to approach political movements and leaders and to deposit their own hopes and aspirations into them um, is something that looks often like a religious identification, you know, no matter how secular. Um, and so this is a clear, clear part of, you know, of what was going on as well, the way that people would identify as Chavista, identify as revolutionaries, and to do so in a wholehearted way rather than a, in a sort of cold calculating, what can I get out of this political movement way? It was this sort of direct and full identification with a cause of social change. That's really interesting, uh, the way you're talking about it now, as uh, um, Chavista identity as a sort of socially bonding force in the same way that religion is for so many people. Um, It gives you this kind of orientation, I guess, in the world. Um, It's interesting, too, why that might be a threat to, for example, the church hierarchy in Venezuela. Um, I'm Roman Catholic, so I follow a little bit about what's going on there. And uh, it's really kind of odd to see, like, the guy who was recently appointed the head of the Jesuits is from Venezuela, which is a pretty big deal. And uh, he um, is critical of Maduro and was critical of Chavez, but he also identifies as a Marxist. So it's all, like, very confusing, it seems like. Like, There are a lot of bishops who are not fans of Maduro, um, but then there are all these kind of very uh, very weird, like, openness to kind of leftist understandings of Christianity within the church, but also, uh, you know, hesitancy to actually endorse the politics as they've materially manifested. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and, and what you've had historically is that is very reactionary elements of the church hierarchy being, you know, against Chavismo. Uh, you know, one, you know, I mean, very, very famous sort of right wing, you know, figures, you know, saying things like there's this giant flood that killed thousands and thousands of people in mudslides. Um, and, you know, one religious figure said that this was punishment for electing Chavez. Um, and mm-hmm. there are, you know, you know, right wing church leaders who are openly calling for the overthrow of the government uh, in, in really the, the sort of you know, most shocking ways. Um, but on the grassroots level, this is never necessarily translated, you know. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations. A lot of these were sponsored by the church in the 70s and 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, the women's circles, which are these participatory, uh, you know, women's discussion groups were sponsored by the church, uh, you know, as well. Um, and so a lot of the, you know, again, this left wing Catholic Catholicism has, has fed into um, a broader, you know, a broader social transformation that's now manifesting. What What's like the, um, I'm always interested in knowing like what the impetus behind the um, sort of bad blood between the like church hierarchies and uh, sort of leftist governments exactly are like uh, I don't know and, and things that I've read about uh, the the revolution in Russia or in Cuba right some of it some of it comes from the the change uh, the change in the way that the the government deals with church property is there something similar going on here in Venezuela or is there other are there other motivations um, from the uh, church hierarchy to oppose Chavez and Maduro you know, I can't. I don't know the precise, you know, details of why, but the the, the reaction was so immediate from certain sectors of the church. I think it was just a broader, yeah. you know. At, at the same time that you got, you know, in Latin America in particular, this sort of left wing liberation theology, um, you had a reaction, an, a radical anti Marxist reaction to it. Um, and so I think I think it was this. I think it was the suspicion that Chavez was a Marxist, was a leftist, was someone who's going to undermine not specifically the church, um, but but the broader property. Yeah elites from which many of these church leaders were drawn and who represented their sort of social, you know, their social group. Um, and so I think, you know, it, you know, my guess is that it's got everything to do with, you know, with a broader anti-Marxism rather than a particular claim they had, although these claims would develop uh, over time. Um, and although, you know, church leaders would attempt to, you know, mediate, you know, different sort of conflicts um, in the process. Um, well, speaking about that mediation by church leaders, uh, Maduro has asked Pope Francis to intervene in the conflict between opposition forces and the government a couple of times. Um, and even though the Pope himself says that dialogue is the best way forward, uh, I just thought it was really interesting that the opposition keeps refusing to come to the table, um, even though they identify with the church in one way or another, it seems like in a lot of cases. Um, do you feel like Pope Francis could actually help navigate a situation like Venezuela's, or do you feel like uh, all of those calls to dialogue maybe um, obscure other contradictions at the heart of Venezuela? 
Yeah, I mean, I think if, if anyone can step in and, and provide a, a sort of mediating role, it's someone like the Pope. But at the same time, precisely what you point out at the end of your question is that what is being obscured by dialogue and mediation? You know, uh, there's a political crisis in Venezuela. There's also an economic crisis in Venezuela based on, you know, that's grounded in complications in the currency regime, which are built on the tensions of the import economy and the falling oil prices. Simply mediating between two different and opposing political positions doesn't necessarily fix these problems. Um, it doesn't necessarily map out an alternative uh, economic order that may be able to weather the storm of the economic crisis. And so I think we kind of fetishize dialogue and mediation uh, without often asking, well, what kind of dialogue and between whom and over what parameters? Um, because, you know, you can you can have a political agreement between the opposition and the government, um, but, you know, an agreement between socialism and radical, you know, rabid capitalism um, is actually much worse than, you know, than, you know, than the alternatives, because what you end up doing is what in many ways the Venezuelan government has been doing for too long, which is to split the difference and to attempt to make partial steps towards socialism while leaving capitalists firmly in the driver's seats. And what then happens is that you get you bear all of the brunt of the global economic fallout. You get punished for not being capitalist enough um, at the same time that you, you know, you don't you can, you know, reap the benefits of, you know, of a full, you know, an endorsement of the capitalist system. So this in between is a, is a painful in between um, and mediation and dialogue doesn't necessarily get us beyond that. Yeah, that's a really helpful comment, actually, to check the um, the fetishization of the idea of like a uh, dialogue and intervention in Christianity. It's something that like uh, Christians do, I think a lot where, you know, we need to mediate, we need to reconcile, but that reconciliation is always, um, I don't know. Um, it, it doesn't help you get through. It just helps you sort of like subside the tension for the moment. So that's a pretty helpful comment, I think. Yeah. That's also, uh, there's something sort of, I wonder if it's almost like pathologically ingrained into Christianity because you see that all over in the United States. Um, I mean, you probably know firsthand, uh, George, given your experience uh, in the academy, but, um, you know, that seems to be the basic, uh, like, knee-jerk reaction to any time a, um, a protest group decides that they shouldn't have fascists speaking at their university. It's like, well, um, dialogue is the kind of thing that's going to change the situation, uh, not, you know, Make, like making a real stand and then sticking by it or something like that. Yeah, but that's never been the case historically. It's really easy to right. point to history and say, like, <laughs> yeah. no, that's bullshit. You don't dialogue yeah, exactly. with fascists. You, don't, <laughs> you can't explain the, the problem is you cannot explain to fascists that they're wrong. You can't explain to white supremacists that there's no basis for race or white supremacy whatsoever because they don't believe it because it's rational. That's not why they're attached to this idea. And so we misunderstand them if we think that we can debate with them or defeat them with, in the battle of ideas. What happens is that when you engage reactionaries and with reprehensible ideologies in a battle of ideas you legitimize those ideas you make them you, you uphold them as worthy of debate yeah i think so uh christians just have a hard time wrapping their mind around that and i think it's unfortunate um they don't realize uh exactly what you said so maybe they'll listen to you <laughs> on this podcast <laughs> i would hope i would hope that they would listen i don't know uh we'll see um well let's uh let's take a step back and i guess uh well take a step back and like uh, looking forward to the future of Venezuela and I guess um, what might happen, uh, what might go on in the future. Um, at the very end of building the commune, you write uh, that the time has come to bet it all on the communes. While this may seem risky, the alternative is to bet on nothing at all. Um, and the, the communes, uh, the idea of the communes in Venezuela is a really motivating idea, at least to me. It's a, a really interesting way uh, that Venezuela has uh, developed, I guess. Um, but what kind of bet do you think that the Maduro government is making uh, with the with the Constituent Assembly and on recent elections um, in terms of the future of Venezuela? I think it's complicated. Uh, you know, when, when I say embedded on the communes, I say, you know, the point is that there's this deep and sustained economic crisis. Um, uh, there's a distortion in the currency system that, you know, has created this black market economy that is absolutely devastating, uh, you know, the Venezuelan economy. And to be perfectly clear, the government bears a huge amount of blame for this, for not correcting it quicker. Um, even, although the dynamic itself is rooted in the structure of the oil economy and the fact of attempting to build this alternative and attempting to build a socialist economy alongside and within a capitalist economy. And so you get punished. You get punished by the black market. You get punished by speculation and smuggling. And this has all been happening uh, in Venezuela. And so one of the alternatives is to just go back toward capitalism in the hopes that you'll start 
stop being punished. Um, and the other alternative is to really go all the way to build a different kind of economy that can produce what people need and eat on a local level. And this is what the communes aspire to do. Now, they don't represent a huge part of the economy. Oil represents a huge part of the economy. And that's, you know, that's always this sort of tempting, uh, you know, alternative to throw your weight behind and, and to just re-engage re fully with global capitalism. Um, and yet the, the government is still attempting to do something in between. Um, and the kind of wager that's being made by the government is very complicated. There's, you know, on the, on the one hand, you can see the Maduro government engaging in emergency measures that include things that look very much like neoliberal austerity. In other words, on some level, passing, uh, you know, passing the the pain of this crisis on to some of the poorer sectors. At the same time, that they try to keep, you know, some of these benefits in place through direct food deliveries and you know, um, and direct access to, uh, you know, you know, subsistence goods um, for the population. Um, but you know, there has been really no decisive move. Um, and on the one hand, it's hard to blame the government because the crisis is so bad. That they've been sort of going to, you know, foreign corporations and going to other countries in an attempt to um, weather the storm, to get loans, to, uh, you know, allow foreign investment in mining and in extraction as a way of uh, being able to, you know, to increase income in the short term. Um, and the difficulty is that this, you know, the danger is that on the one hand, economically, this doesn't solve the problems, the fundamental problems of the Venezuelan economy, um, but that politically it's sapping the strength and the resolve of Chavez. Um, and I've long said that if you don't, if Chavismo doesn't make perfectly clear how it's different from the old order, then it won't survive. Um, people need to know precisely why they're voting for this alternative, you know, this alternative vision of society. And if that alternative looks pretty much the same as what always existed before, then they're going to stop voting for it, especially when the economy is bad. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um... I don't know, I guess it's just a hard bet when, like, the left actually gets in a position of power and you don't really have the luxury of just imagining what you would do. Trying to solve real-life material problems where people can't get food is, like, a very hard thing um, to sort out. But I think, you, it, I don't know, it's interesting to put it the way that you did at the end there, that you, you really need to find a way to articulate why you're different or why what you're doing is different in order to get that kind of buy-in. Um, I wonder... Yeah, uh, and this is, it's not, it's, it cuts against the pragmatic politics, and I think we're seeing the failure of pragmatic politics across the globe. You know, this is the sort of Hillary Clinton idea of just being, you know, the least, the sort of least, you know, offensive and the most boring possible candidate <laughs> that's unwilling to take any, any kind of stakes. Yeah, and and, <laughs> and this is, a, it's an utter failure, and it's a failure of, uh, of imagination, and it's also a failure of grasping what's going on in the world. You know, Hillary's probably the only one who didn't realize that we lived in a moment of populist upsurge, right? And who thought she could just be a traditional establishment candidate. Um, and, you know, and, and it was another failure. And we're seeing it left and right. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that, that even radicals and revolutionaries need to understand that pragmatism seems and is posed as being the safe bet when often it's the most dangerous. Hmm. Uh, I wonder what you might say about how all that feeds into the United States left a little more. Um, you know, what it, what would it mean for United States leftist groups like whatever the DSA or the PSL or a number of other um, leftist organizations to start thinking hard about uh, building real grassroots movements that aren't just, you know, making statements and things like that, um, but doing the work that they have been doing since the election, which is trying to get people out in the streets, trying to get people organizing strikes and that sort of a thing. Um, do you feel like Venezuela has, like, good lessons that uh, we can learn from them uh, in terms of how they did that, or is that, like, a very particular situation? I mean, it is a very particular situation, but the lessons, I mean, like any other situation, once you, what you can do is you can strip away that particularity in an attempt to see what, you know, what lessons we can learn, what we can use. And I think the way you do that is, is not in the erroneous and simplistic way we often see, which is say, oh, well, Chavez won an election, therefore let's run a leftist leader, we'll win the election, whatever. Um, you know, Chavez was elected because... They were, you know, in the aftermath of a mass riot and rebellion that shook the political order to its very bones um, and a military coup in which he attempted to overthrow the government by force and failed and went to prison and spread a movement, you know, across the country in the aftermath of that. It's not so it's not as easy as running candidates. You know, that is not the lesson from Venezuela. Um, the lesson is that the power lay in the grassroots movements. Um, and that that power often manifests as mass rebellion and resistance. In other words, Ferguson, Baltimore, this is the source 
of political change in the United States as well. And we can see that, uh, you know, people don't want to recognize it, but the only reason that we're talking the way that we are in the aftermath of Black Lives Matter is not because Black Lives Matter asked nicely, um, yeah. but because people rebelled, because people explosively rebelled in a way that no one could, you know, could, could ignore. Um, and this is one of the, you know, this is one of the main lessons. The other one coming out of the sort of prospective construction of something like the communes um, has to do with seizing territory, taking over space, building movements that can govern that space. Um, and I think this is a lesson that's being learned. It's a lesson that had some bearing on Occupy as well, which took over space and refused to leave. It has some bearing on projects like the Jackson Cush plan in, you know, in Jackson, Mississippi to build a local self-sustainable economy, um, you know, black governed self-sustainable economy. Um, and I think it also has a lot of bearing on how we build movements locally. For example, in Philadelphia, if we're doing anti-police work, um, we need to understand that it's not so much about protesting the latest police murder as it is about building structures and self-defense structures and rapid response structures to not only prevent police abuse, but also to build community power um, as the alternative to that, so that people are not calling the police, and when the police show up, um, people can scrutinize their, you know, their behavior and govern, you know, govern communities on our own without the help of the state. Yeah, I'm curious too about what it means to like continue to build that as a sort of like a movement across the United States that can gain steam. Like uh, one thing that I thought was so inspiring reading Building the Commune is the way that you articulate all these different groups. Like communes are created by virtue of a variety of very diverse associations that get you know legitimated and then pulled into this kind of broader project um we did a couple episodes about the people's congress of resistance with jody dean and derek ford a while back and uh it kind of seemed like um it's not that those are communes obviously but there was this attempt to have um representatives from groups that were building resistance black lives matter groups against islamophobia etc and to articulate like a unifying manifesto that they could sort of gather around and adopt resolutions and participate in an alternative decision-making structure. Um, do you feel like those are things in the United States that can really happen? It's such like a massive geographical uh, entity, the United States of America, um, and it has all these diverse uh, populations. Um, are, are there ways that we can sort of unify around those kinds of things? I mean, the question I think isn't, can we do it? The question is, do we have any alternative? And we don't, you know, this is the only way that we're going to build revolutionary movements. This is the only way that this transformation will be able to happen. Um, and insofar as we're able to develop these sorts of alternative structures, uh, you know, what, you know, what I and others call dual power structures, um, insofar as we can do that, that's how we're going to be able to build movements that can then go on the offensive. Um, that can then, you know, take the fight uh, to the enemy. Um, and so we don't have an alternative. This is what we have to do. This is our essential task. But the point in the present, I think, is to make it clear to everyone that we can't simply march. We can't simply protest. We can't simply make demands or run, uh, you know, candidates or whatever else, uh, you know, is being proposed. But we have to build um, these alternative structures um, that can weather the storm and that can strengthen our movements as we move forward. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a strong that's such a strong note to end on um yeah uh i'm just thinking i live really near st louis and the uh, uh all all of the st louis left organizations have been marching against jason stockley uh um for like the last you know month and a half they've been marching every day and um that's you know very good i guess to um to march and be in the street but uh but what you're saying about dual power is uh very relevant Absolutely. Because, I mean, you know, they, they'll, they'll wait for the march to end, right? Yeah. They'll, they'll go out, they'll police it, right. they'll go home, and, you know, and, and they'll be perfectly happy to do that forever. Yeah, there's something kind of uh, performative about marching and protesting that isn't bad per se, but it's like a predictable kind of pageantry in a way, you know, like like uh, there's a liturgy to it. You, people show up, you, you say the chants you're supposed to say, the people that are supposed to speak, speak, and then you kind of you know do your thing and then everybody goes home and then you can keep doing that but like like the police have been to enough protests to know what's going on uh protesters have been to enough protests to know what's going on and that's kind of the the routine i guess so yeah that sort of building dual power um that just seems like a really helpful theoretical but also very practical tool absolutely um well thanks george for coming on i know yeah, that uh, so things are pretty busy for you these days um so uh it's just nice to make time and yeah hopefully i don't know you, you didn't ask us to promote your books but just uh in in good faith by virtue of being people who've actually read a few of them uh we can <laughs> attest that they're good and worth uh getting and reading yeah. um and supporting you and following your work so uh yeah thanks for providing all the scholarly resources that you have hopefully you can keep doing it let's hope so 
Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks. You know, thanks for, so much for having me. Yeah. And, and this is a, this is a good conversation. It's always good to, to bring in, you know, these, these other aspects of the conversation to connect what we're doing here to what's going on in other parts of the world. And so, you know, I was glad to be involved in that. Thanks for listening to Magnificast. Please remember to subscribe to us on iTunes, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our tiny letter, and like us everywhere else on the internet as well. Um, if you want to support us financially, that would be very awesome, and you can give us a little bit of your money at uh, our Patreon, patreon.com slash Magnificast. All right, thanks for listening. Get up at church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord.